Hi, this is Brian Kim. I'm going to share with you this case. This is a lady who had axenfeld riger syndrome. She came in with a cataract. She also has microcornea and weak zonules. She needed iris hooks as well due to a very irregular pupil. This patient has seen multiple ophthalmologists, and for whatever reason, they declined to do her cataract surgery. And so she actually found me through this YouTube channel and saw that I did complicated anterior segment work, and she had to travel quite a ways to see me. When I first saw her, I could tell she was very anxious. She was very high myope with high astigmatism as well. And because of the complicated history with her eyes, she was quite apprehensive, asked me a lot of questions. And after an extensive informed consent, she chose a toric IOL with near target correction so that she could still see up close, knowing well aware that her eyes are not quite the typical eyes. I'm using a corneal mark to help me center and size my rexus. Note how much larger the ring looks compared to the cornea. This is because she does have a very small cornea. I'm going to go ahead and make my paracentesis incisions for the iris hooks, as well as my incisions for my actual cataract surgery. I make six total incisions, four of which are going to be used for the hooks. These are the blue hooks. I believe these are from Katina. I have no financial interest in these hooks, but I do like these hooks because they're easy to put in and they have that round stopper, which is easy to spin and rotate that tip downward. I prefer to use a two-handed technique, sliding it in with one hand, dialing the stopper, and then pulling and cinching down the hook. I prefer iris hooks over rings in these situations because, one, the irregularity is better to control with each separate hook, and you can pick out the quadrants in the actual location where you want to place the hook to retract the iris. You're also providing support of the iris hook at the level of the sclera, whereas the ring is only being supported within the iris itself. I'm injecting dispersive viscoelastic, and then I'm doing my triplanar corneal incision. I'm making a vertical groove, placing the blade into the groove, and then tunneling through the cornea, and then diving down. And this is the triplanar corneal incision. I make a paracentesis underneath my main incision through the sclera, and then place another iris hook here. And this is because in cases of potential iris prolapse, I like to support the iris at the level of the incision so that it does not prolapse into my incision. When using a puncture style capsule rexus, however, I quickly realized that the zonules are very weak. There is hardly any counterforce when I'm pushing down with the forceps. So I decide to go with the cystotome and I make a little cut and then make a little flap as well. I'm going to go ahead and I'm trying to go circumferentially with my forceps, trying to follow the corneal marks to help me center and size the rexus. Fortunately, I didn't encounter any difficulty doing the rexus. Perhaps this is less about zonular damage and more about zonular laxity due to her high myopia. I go ahead and burp the viscoelastic out and I begin my capsular fornix hydrodissection technique. I place a cannula underneath the anterior capsular surface on the contralateral side, I point it down and then get a nice fluid wave decompressed to the left. And then I begin to spin the lens on the right side. And you can see that the lens spins quite nicely. I lift the incision with the chopper, go in with irrigation off to minimize decimase trauma. And then I'm gonna go ahead and start to remove the surface epinuclear material. I place the chopper out to the contralateral equator underneath the anterior capsular surface. I turn the phacoid tip vertically and I'm able to crush and break the lens in half. And this is a double chop maneuver. I place the chopper out to the contralateral equator, pull it towards the phacoid tip, and I'm able to crush the right hemineucleus. And this is the cross chop maneuver. I'm being very ginger and careful as I'm disassembling this lens. I was able to prolapse that one quadrant up out of the bag using the chopper. I pull the second quadrant out with the chopper and begin crushing it with mechanical fracturing. The first two quadrants are out now. I'm placing the chopper again out to the equator. The phacoid tip is deep. I'm able to pull the chopper centrally and crush the second hemineucleus in half. I'm using successive mechanical fracturing forces to break the lens pieces into smaller pieces. And I'm able to use high vacuum and using really the chopper and the phacoid tip to crush the lens pieces into smaller pieces and then aspirating the lens pieces with the high vacuum. I'm using successive mechanical fracturing forces by crushing the lens material between the chopper and the phagotip. 
placing the chopper out to the equator, bringing the phaco tip deep, crushing the lens piece, bisecting the lens pieces, and then grabbing the lens pieces with a little bit of vacuum, then crushing the lens piece with the chopper and using high vacuum to aspirate the lens pieces out. Now, this is the last quadrant. I place the chopper out to the equator, pull it centrally towards the phaco tip. I'm able to crush that quadrant in half and then the lens pieces, as they become smaller, I'm able to aspirate the lens pieces. I'm carefully, again, prolapsing the lens pieces out of the bag with a chopper rather than chasing them with high vacuum because I can inadvertently grab the bag, especially if the bag is weak with weak zonules. And now I'm going to pull the epinucleus out very gently. I'm using the chopper to prolapse the epinucleus out from an anterior position, and the lens is now completely removed. I'm pushing BSS, pull the phaco tip out, switching to the INA. I'm trying to maintain some level of chamber stability. And then I begin the cortical removal, starting sub incisionally with the INA handpiece. And with this polymer tip, I have a lot of confidence. I'm able to polish very nicely and I'm able to avoid causing any capsular damage in the process. I'm able to switch to the polish mode and more confidently polish the underneath the anterior capsule surface as well as polishing the posterior capsular surface due to the polymer tip. I use a BSS cannula to pulse some BSS pressure into the sub-incisional capsular fornix. And you can see there's a little bit of cortical material that's there. And then go ahead and switch and push cohesive viscoelastic into the capsular bag. And then I'm gonna sweep the sub-incisional space with the sweeper. And I'll be able to liberate any potential hidden cortical material that's there. I'm also going to be polishing underneath the anterior capsular surface on this side, and I want to switch to the other side as well, making sure I polish, remove any lens epithelial cells as well as any potential cortical material. I inject a single piece acrylic lens into the capsular bag and then use the sweep to make sure that the haptics are not adherent to the optic and making sure both haptics are within the capsular bag. Because this is a toric lens, I'm trying to make sure that the hash marks are going to be on axis to the toric correction. I'm going to go ahead and remove each of the iris hooks. You want to grab the base of the hook with one forcep, pull the stopper back, and then rotate the stopper so that the hook part is disengaged from the iris, and then you can pull out the hook fairly easily. Once all the iris hooks are out, I'm going to go ahead and do the INA going underneath the lens, making sure I remove all the viscoelastic from underneath the lens and in the bag. And then I'm going to carefully remove all the viscoelastic in the anterior chamber. Because this is a toric lens, I'm going to have to be very sure that the lens orientation is exactly what it needs to be to get maximal correction. This patient had quite a bit of astigmatism and needed a T9 correction. And even then, it wasn't a full correction because of her high myopia and high astigmatism. But nonetheless, this was her best option for maximal uncorrected visual acuity at near. So after her surgery, she was quite pleased. She noticed her vision was better, although she did acknowledge the limitations in her vision. She noticed an improvement in her vision and function. So I hope this was helpful to you. Please like and subscribe, and I thank you for your attention.